second time it hit me, it, it grabbed my left leg and it, it dragged me through the water. I remember having to hold my breath. That's sort of how long it felt like I was under there for. And it shook me around. You know when the, you see that footage of sharks going up to like a dead whale carcass and they grab something and, they, and, and they go, yeah, yeah, that's sort of what it was doing to me. And that ended up in my, my left leg being ripped off um, above the knee while I was in the water. And yeah, that's when I started to lose lots of blood. That's Chris Blows. He's one of the very few people on earth to literally escape the jaws of death. In 2015, Chris was surfing at Fishery Bay in Port Lincoln, South Australia, when he came face to face with every surfer's worst nightmare, a great white shark. Which felt like being hit by a car, um, but soon realized I was being attacked by a, a four and a half, five meter white shark. Surviving the horrific attack defied near impossible odds that to this day, Chris still can't fully comprehend. 10% chance of surviving the night and then 0% chance of waking up with no brain damage. And that was due to the massive blood loss and sustained CPR. The ordeal deeply affected his mates, his family and everyone who helped save his life that day. Not to mention the impact on Chris who had to learn how to walk, live and eventually surf again make that effort to get back into surfing. That was that, that one, that big part of my life that was not there and I had to get that back. And once I got that back, I knew I could, you know, I'd pretty much have my life back to normal. But yeah, it's definitely been a big part of my mental recovery. He's written it all down in the recently published book titled Caught Inside, an epic tale he's lived to tell. Welcome to Young Blood, an award-winning podcast on a mission to make the mental health of young men a top priority. My name's Callum McPherson, I'm a journalist, and this is our platform to open up and share stories of what we've been through, because we're not alone. Let's do it. Well, when did you fall in love with surfing? Growing up, we always did those those trips down to Port Elliot every, every, every summer, and I think I would have been about 14. Um, and after after I got my first surfboard, then I slowly got better at it, and yeah, fell in love with it sort of straight away. What is it about it, or how do you put the magic of it into words? I think just being out in the water, just it's something about it. Just you just calm down, and you and you're not you're away from your phone, you're away from all that social media stuff, and you just just relax. It's something it's just peaceful out there. Something about it, yeah. What do you think it is about surfing that people who have never done it couldn't understand? Um, how fun it is, I suppose. That would be the main thing. Um, and once you actually get that, when you get that first good wave, yeah, you're instantly hooked. And yeah, I don't know anyone that's got a real, have actually surfed and then got a really good wave and gone, I'll never do that again. Because it seems like there's a big gap between people who surf and people who don't in terms of understanding it. And it's like for people who surf, it becomes a way of life and you just absolutely love it. And it's something yeah. that's sort of hard to put into words. And then people who don't surf, you're like, well, the sea's pretty dangerous for like a lot of reasons and I can't understand why people would just go out there and like put themselves at risk yeah. for that. But and, I, and I think that's a, the biggest fear too. People, a lot of people aren't very good swimmers um, and then also people, the number one fear is, is sharks and especially living in South Australia. Yeah. Um, and also down the South Coast, Middleton area, can be hard, actually pretty hard spot to learn how to surf um, properly. I think that... Um, Especially when it takes a, that, especially surfing around Middleton area, it's so hard to get all the way out the back. And if you're not surfing fit, then you can go for one surf and go, I'm never doing that again. Yeah. Um, and it takes a lot longer to get better at it, I think. Because um, it could be something I imagine that would be potentially quite overwhelming to start off with if you went too large and you were getting smashed by waves. Yeah, or, yeah, just you know, ease into it. Yeah. And yeah, um, and that can put someone off straight away, getting one bad hold down or getting a board to the head or... Yeah. yeah. Is it really something that you often grow up with and so it just I, sort of becomes I think so, yeah. I grew up just um, surfing, uh, just getting on a bodyboard and just cruising the waves and, and always loved the ocean. Uh, but yeah, once I got a surfboard, like I said, I... Yeah, fell in love with it. How do you think it's shaped you as a person? I don't think it's shaped me too. I think it's just made, it sort of made me the person I am. Um, um, yeah, I suppose it shaped me, the, the group of friends that I hang around with as well. Um, but I don't think it's really shaped me too much as a, as a person. I, was, I, always, I am what I am pretty well. Let's walk us through that, that day that changed your life. Um, yeah, so Anzac Day 2015, um, Chloe and myself, um, I'd moved to Air Peninsula. We'd been living there for about three years, and I'd surfing at a spot known as Fisheries Bay, um, and specifically Right Point. I'd probably been surfing for about an hour uh, when I just got a wave, and 
I was padding back out on the channel. I reckon I almost got to the suck rock, is where, which is where the takeoff spot is, uh, when I got hit, which felt like being hit by a car, um, but soon realised I was being attacked by a, a four-and-a-half-five-metre white shark. At that moment, I thought, shit, you know, this could be the end of my life. Because I was paddling back out, it got, yeah, the other side of my board on my left flank, and it was just sort of shaking me around um, violently. And that first bite mark that I got, you know, on the sort of, side of my board would protect me a little bit, but I still had these huge, you know, almost like hand-sized bite marks in my left flank. Not long after, it let go, and that's when my two mates, Nick and Brock, realised it was me, and they started to paddle back out. And I think they got within, you know, an arm's reach. And the shark turned, like, on this 90-degree angle and just come back at me again. But because I was off my board, the second time it grabbed me and it, and it, and it pulled me underwater and, and we sort of disappeared, the, myself, the board, and, yeah, the shark under the, under the ocean. So, yeah. So it latched onto you the second time? Yeah, it grabbed, the second time it hit me, it, it grabbed my left leg and it, it dragged me through the water. I remember having to hold my breath that's sort of how long it felt like I was under there for. And it shook me around. You know, when the, you see that footage of sharks going up to like a dead whale carcass and they grab something and, they, and, and they go, yeah, yeah, that's sort of what it was doing to me. And that ended up in my, my left leg being ripped off um, above the knee while I was in the water. And yeah, that's when I started to lose lots of blood because I had that, that first bite mark on my hip and then... And then my left leg had been ripped off and above the knee. You remember all of it. Which I is, do, yeah. Isn't often what you sort of hear from these kinds of things where it's so traumatic and people lose consciousness or yep. other people sort of fill it in, but it seems like it's incredibly vivid for you. It is, yeah, to the to a certain point. I mean, I remember it's not as it's not as clear in my mind as it was for Nick and Brock. I mean, they, they witnessed this thing up close range and, you know, it's something they'll never be able to forget. Once it... it pulled my leg off and I started to lose lots of blood. That's when I started to, to slip out of consciousness. I think I, I tried to climb onto Nick's back um, and we got hit by a wave and we sort of dispersed a bit. And then they decided it'd be easier if one of them got on either side of me and they sort of frog leaped me to shore. But I was lucky that someone that um, watched the attack, um, he'd already had his leg rope off his board and they tied that around my stump while I was still in the water once I got to the water's edge. That's a tourniquet. Yeah, and they had to tie a few knots because like, with the leg rope, it's kind of stretchy, and they just couldn't, couldn't. They they got it firstly tied enough. They just did a, a you know a number of knots, and that definitely definitely helped stop the blood. And I think that if that didn't was a couple more minutes without that on, I would have would have bled to death for sure. And then the other problem was yeah, at the bottom of a cliff as well. Yeah, so and that's the thing. I was you know thirty kilometers, thirty five kilometers from the nearest hospital, at the bottom of a cliff. Um, with about 150 stairs to get up yeah, to. It wasn't looking good. Yeah, and 700 kilometres from the nearest trauma centre in Adelaide. So, yeah, the odds were definitely stacked against me. Yeah. yeah. So your mates really stepped up mm, big they, time they did, in that yeah. moment. Yeah. Because yeah. it pretty much well, incomprehensible for people to try to understand how they'd react in that moment but i imagine that the sheer terror of that and realizing what had happened yeah and then obviously you're at a point where you're in and out of consciousness and you're going to die without them there to help you yeah. and then they actually have the presence of mind to think about okay what do we need to do right now to save chris's yeah. life and they did that i'd imagine there'd be some people that would just be overcome and freeze or i think i think they did like once they got the shore uh Every, I remember Nick saying that everyone was just standing around like and just looking at me and just like especially Nick and Brock they were they were shaking and um and it was wasn't for uh, a guy called Joe who watched her watched her from the cliff so he just happened his, to be there yeah he's an, an older guy um well not it would be in his maybe his 50s and I just remember how calm he was coming down because uh, Nick and Brock were just hysterical mm. and by the time Joe got there um, he sort of I just remember him calming everyone down it's like right this is what we're going to do like, we've now got to get him on so this so board so you were conscious yeah, for that yeah and he was just calmed down everyone everyone was freaking out so Nick was like oh put him on my back and carry me up carry me up the cliff and it was like no nah, it's not going to happen <laughs> so I was very lucky that, that day there would have been maybe 14, 15 surfers right okay and which is can be unlikely at that spot yeah yeah and they managed to put me onto a board and they stretched me across these slippery rocks which uh, it blows me away like I, 
it's hard to walk with those, across those rocks at the best of time and not hurt yourself yep. going how they carried me across those rocks and then up a flight of stairs. It would be, I think we counted like 150 steps. And having to do it quickly yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and didn't hurt himself. Yeah. And, I, and you know, they, everyone just worked as a team. They were, I remember them jumping over me um, at each spot like, and, and it just, once they got going, they just, yeah. Yeah. It just worked somehow. But um, yeah, at that, that stage, my body was already starting to shut down. And but you remember getting carried up those stairs. I do, yeah. And not being able to breathe was the biggest thing. I was just, I think that was because there was not much blood left in my body. That obviously your, your blood carries around the oxygen. Yep. And I so say your when brain. You, yeah. Well. And then they say when you, when you lose lots of blood that you can find it hard to breathe. Was your mind blank at that moment? No, and that's all those, all those thoughts were coming into my head. And it got to a point where I couldn't breathe. And then it got to the point where right now my body is actually shutting down and I actually just wanted to go to sleep. It sort of made me fear death less now. It was just like almost like a warmth that come over my body. But you knew it was death. And I knew and I thought, I'm not going to be able to, you know, all those things I, th- I look forward to, like getting married, having kids, all that sort of stuff. I was like, that's not going to happen anymore. So you felt that in that moment? Yeah, and because I had Nick, you know I me, mean? oh, you still got to give me those guitar lessons, you still got to... I still got to, you know, he was saying that stuff to me when I was getting carried up the cliff to try and keep me awake. Yeah. Um, and so hard for him to hold that together to be able to yeah. keep talking to you while yeah, doing yeah. that. Yeah, and they were slapping me in the face and trying to keep me awake. But they already had Nick, someone reversed Nick's Land Cruiser um, up at the top of the stairs and they, they chucked me in the back of that. And I, I don't remember any of that ride, but... And they drove to meet the ambulance? Yeah, they would have got, I think we got 11 kilometres down the road and they... By the time I, we met the ambulance there, there my heart had, def, had completely stopped. I mean, the, the paramedics opened the back door of the ambulance and I was, like, lifeless and I was as white as a sheet of paper and, and no one was doing CPR. Like, they, the paramedics thought they were too late. So, But then they gave it a crack, obviously. They did, yeah. Um, once and they got me into the back of the ambulance, they started to administer CPR straight away. Uh, I was very lucky that, that day that there was three paramedics and one was able to drive while um, the two other paramedics did CPR on like while we we're under transport mm. on the way to hospital and just little things they did they had they don't they don't carry blood on ambulances so they just put an IV drip into me and that kept any little bit of blood I had in my body um, just moving around and I think that definitely played a vital part in me surviving and 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 surviving without any and brain damage because that that cpr started at 10 a.m and didn't stop till 11 15 a.m an hour and a quarter later mm. when i was in port Lincoln hospital so in that time i think i had i had eight units of blood and 12 units of plasma which is the whole unmatched blood stock in port Lincoln hospital so yeah did you talk to those paramedics again yeah i went back and saw them um a couple of months later what did they say well, they were in tears, like they couldn't believe when I walked in um, to the hospital. Because seeing what they see and the position you were in, mm. and they would have thought, outcome, yeah. they would have thought, like this guy's not going to make it. Yeah, yeah, it's you know has what happened to me has had yeah a ripple effect on everyone, um, not just me, but all the people that were involved, the people that watched on the cliff, um, the poor bloke that went to go retrieve my board on the other side of the bay with my legs still attached to my leg rope to, you know, the paramedics and nurses that were forced to, you know, they would have never seen anything like that. And not even the paramedics, they, they won't, they could go their whole career and not see something Why like that. Why did you go back to get the leg? Um, well, so they went, my board washed up. So the, the shark must have, when it grabbed my leg and bit it off, it mustn't have had the actual leg rope part in, the, in, a, in, my, in its mouth. Um, so it didn't snap the leg rope. So you could see where the shark was the whole time when we were getting carried up the cliff because it was like a fishing float. It was just getting dragged across there. Um, it was like, they call it tombstoning because when you get washed under and your, your board sort of flicks around on top of the water um, and they could see where the shark was the whole time and it must have let go of it when it got to the other side of the bay and then they, they thought, we better go collect his board because they could see it washed up on the beach and then, yeah, yeah. my leg was still attached. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. And that's maybe why I didn't take the leg as well because it was stuck to the board. Yeah, yeah, and just yeah. sort of you can't get rid of it. <laughs> right. Okay. So it's come to hospital with me, but they they couldn't attach that. No. Um, no. Yeah, but uh, I was going to say pretty brave getting back in the water to go and get a leg. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I washed up on the beach, yeah. but yeah, it um, yeah, all those all those things would have been pretty traumatic for yeah. everyone involved. What did they do with it? I think it 
Yeah, they brought it in her bag and um, back to the hospital. Back to the hospital, right, and okay. um, just in case, like I think if I died, then they could bury, uh, bury it with me. Or and I don't know what happens to it. Whether I think it might have come to Adelaide, and then um, it just gets incarcerated with the other legs that okay. people get amputated or whatever happens to them. I'm not sure. <laughs> and when you when you got back to the hospital, when was the next time you were conscious? Yeah, so. I woke. I arrived in in Royal Eight Hospital. I think it was one o'clock. It was about six hours after my attack. So you'd been in the chopper. Yeah. So being in the, I got airlifted uh, once I'd stabilised me enough for Port Lincoln, um, and then I went I was rushed straight into emergency surgery. Um, and then they put me in a juice coma for ten days. Were you out for that whole period? Yeah. As well? So I don't remember any of that. Yeah. And and that's that 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 point was the heart that night. My family received like the worst possible news that I yeah. had. 10% chance of surviving the night and then 0% chance of waking up with no brain damage. And that was due to the massive blood loss and sustained CPR, which is, yeah. I think the, one of the paramedics that took the call um, said that, you know, she doesn't know why she sent the helicopter over either because the chance of surviving CPR under blood loss was virtually 0%. And it still is. And I think it might be a little bit higher than that now. But... And she still doesn't know why she sent it, but she said what she's seen now. She said she wouldn't have she wouldn't have sent that helicopter. So it mustn't have been my time. Yeah. Do you think about that much now? I do a little bit. I think I, it's um, I realise how lucky I am to be here. It makes me not take all those things for granted that I did before, and or just the day to day things like getting in out of bed, uh, going to the toilet in the middle of the night on crutches, just. All those little things and, and, and being able to get up and walk and, and get back and surfing and doing all that stuff. Um, yeah. And some people don't don't ever don't can't get that opportunity again and yeah, I just try not to glow on my injuries too much and got that and just get on with it. Mm. And what was the process of coming back like after you know, from when you did wake up and you didn't have brain damage? Yeah. Um, how quickly did you kick into thinking that you wanted to get into your recovery i think um i was very it was hard uh when i when i first woke up um i was very confused i was on lots of pain medication and, I, and you'd been out for 10 days 10 days yeah and but i sort of wasn't out of the woods yet i was on lots of pain medication and my, i'd gone into complete renal failure so my liver and kidneys had started to shut down and i'd i went really yellow and i swelled right up my whole body so I, for the, even for those few days after I woke up, I didn't really know where I was. You know, the, the dialysis machine was not next to me. I was so high that I thought that it was a Coke vending machine. And every time that <laughs> the nurse went out, I'd try and get a Coke out of it. And <laughs> but um, once I'd got past that um, stage, it yeah, it, and I'd learned about the loss of my leg, and um, yeah, it was that was a really you know I was devastated and i was like how because i didn't have any idea about prosthetics i didn't have but you know whether i was told i probably wouldn't be able to work as a carpenter again probably definitely not be able to surf again yes yeah, so you thought you'd lost your life yeah as much as without yeah. actually dying yeah and i don't think those um feelings really sunk in properly i think because i was on so much pain medication i was always reasonably positive um that i was going to be able to do that uh, but it wasn't until I got back home and, and I was off all the pain medication, or mm. most of it, that everything really sunk in. And yeah, that's probably when I had my lowest point, I think. And yeah, that was hard time for me because I wasn't able to, you know, even use a prosthetic um, for for quite some time after that. Also, because because it has to heal to a certain yeah, point. Yeah, and because I swelled up after my um, surgery, after I woke up, my surgery, all my wounds opened up and once they've opened up they can't stitch them up again so all that first bite mark they had to let heal from the inside out so that was months of like packing um my wounds and that's all stuff that my wife chloe ended up doing and i guess being at home and looking at yourself and seeing for the first time like the damage that was done and yeah uh, i can't imagine but knowing that you're attacked by a monster yeah, yeah. And being like, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then just seeing everyone else having to, like, do everything for me, it was like, mm. really got to me as well. I, you know, I like to be able to do things myself and having to get help to go to the toilet and get in and out of the shower. 
Yeah, so you have that level of embarrassment or yeah. shame about it, even though yeah. obviously it's not your fault. But yeah. Yeah. as a man, there's things that you're always used to doing independently and yeah, and they're hard to and get over that. From you. And I knew, I knew it was long term, but I was get pretty frustrated at that stage and just wanted to get on with it. But you just had to take it easy and try not to rush things. I knew if I rushed, I got told by other guys that um, they'd lost legs. They said if you rush that rehab side too much, then and especially your healing of your wounds and stuff, then you're going to end up, it's going to end up worse in the long run. And I sort of did that a little bit and I probably rushed getting back into prosthetic too quickly and I still have issues with that first bite mark. I've had surgery redone on it and okay. stuff like that. But so they, they were right. They were but, right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was stubbing me. It's those things where yeah. you have to do it yourself before you actually yeah. realise. Yeah, yeah. So what got you through it when it was really tough on you mentally and you're at that low point? Um, I think early on was... For me, it was a lot of my family. I'm very lucky. I got lots of good friends and family. Um, I never enjoyed. Yeah, I know. I didn't like speaking to counselors and stuff like that. For me, I know that can be great for some people, but the best thing for me, I, there's this support group called Bike Club, um, and then there's also Limbs for Life, which is like an, a similar thing for people with amputees. But I think the biggest thing was um, a group. It's a Shark Attack Survivors support, uh, support group. And it's built up of, I think it's about almost 400 members now from all around Australia and around the world. And it's not just shark attack victims, but it's people that were involved in the shark attack. Yeah. And we catch up maybe, we did catch up maybe once a year, um, but we just virtually catch up and, and we share our stories and and we found that, the, and let us know how, you know, share each other how we were going. And um, there's guys that had, had some serious PTSD and all kinds mm. of stuff going on and just actually reaching out and letting people know how you're going and um, sharing a story we found was the best thing for us. Because um, it's such a rare and traumatic and horrific thing to happen yep. that it'd be so hard to find someone who you felt like knew what that was like Yeah, because so few people do and certainly live yep. to tell the, the tale. Yeah. Um, it did feel like maybe you sort of had to hold hold on to it or you couldn't say it to someone that really got what it was like to relive that thought in your head or have, have been in that moment where it bit you the first time and then came back around and you still remember that? Like, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and, and that's the case for everyone as well. At some stage in your life, whether it be major or minor, you're going to go through some kind of traumatic experience that you don't know how it's going to affect you. Mm. And some people think that, there's no one to reach out to. There's no one to talk to that about. But there is. There's always someone that's been through something similar or has gone through the same thing. There and that's always what, is. Yeah. yeah. And that's why um, the bike club was great. Like, and I just watched people, you know, just sharing my story there. I remember speaking to this, um, this guy called Kevin and he lost his son to a shark attack, a tiger shark attack, um, a few months before mine. And it was like really hard for him. He was struggling a lot, even though he wasn't there, he didn't witness it. But... I think he just he would just had this thing in his head that it was um, really really traumatic for him and and it must have been so painful and it must have been the worst experience ever. But he and he just wanted me to tell him my whole story and I did and I just could see the relief on his face when I said that I had no pain when I was being attacked and I had it happened so quickly that I would rather die of a shark attack than die of something like cancer or mm. something like that. Um, I could just see that relief on his face and yeah that. and that's because the shock of it's so massive that you can't yep. feel anything yeah yeah um, obviously you can feel that you're being shaken yeah it's around. funny your, your body goes into fight or fly and and it just shuts all those things down um, I had no pain at all and then none of that pain started until I woke up when it hit you were you surprised at first like what was that or did you know oh, I knew yeah once it hit me and I knew straight away and, and it, it blew, blows me away how strong they are um, yeah, just the pressure of its jaws too. Um, it felt like, and how it was shaking me around, it, it's like me grabbing my phone. The power difference in that, that's just, I felt like I was helpless. But I couldn't get around and punch it, do anything no. like that. <laughs> um, yeah, and it was in control the whole time when I said you know, four and a half meter shark can just turn on 90 degrees and come back at me. And I just that moment of realisation, uh, was it like, you know, this is this is it yeah 100 percent. i thought that was it and that's definitely comes here and you could tell i was scared because i think the first anyone knew of the shark was me screaming when it hit so um and instantly everyone went for the rocks 
And, and people surf all their lives. They might see one or hopefully not get attacked by one, but yeah. it is still extremely rare even though you're in their territory and then all of a sudden there's that moment where it's like, this is actually happening. Yeah. And you think you always go as a surfer, like, oh, you know they're there, but they never, never happened to me. Mm. But the reality is these things do happen and, yeah, you'd be amazed uh, how how strong you mentally you can be if you um when you when you're faced with adversity and um yeah ev- everyone has it in them um you don't i don't think you realize until you get put in that situation but yeah um it bl- when it when it grabbed you did you have in your mind anything that you could possibly try to do or was it just like not really i was that scared um yeah and i just wanted to get out of the water <laughs> yeah. Yeah. when i was swimming towards nick and brock they could just see by the look on my face and i was already sort of floundering above the water um struggling to stay above it um and they were looking at you when it grabbed yeah you and pulled you yeah under. yeah I, I was you know arms reach with nick and, and nick remembers they both lifted their feet when it came up to me the second time and um because they could feel it moving under them and then um nick remembers the little sensors on its nose and everything how it rolled its eyes back before it bit me so they saw its face come yeah up. they saw everything yeah yeah and it's that would only made a year away a you know? nightmare isn't it like, yeah 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 so do you guys talk about it much we do i suppose you would have gone over it a fair bit in the we last have. five years or so. we have yeah and that was really hard at the start especially for um nick and brock because they would have had ptsd from it too yeah yeah and they, they've you know they've got their own battles but they have I think the best thing for them is sort of seeing me get back in the water and, and do that um, stuff has helped them. But they've probably gone through just as much trauma, if not more. Poor old Brock really regrets sitting in the ambulance wire. He doesn't know why he got in there, but um, sitting in the ambulance wire, they did CPR on me, you know. Mm. And, it's a long time to be looking at your yeah. friend who's probably going to die. And, you know, that stuff I don't remember, but that, all that extra stuff, you know, they were there for the shark attack and then and they watched all that extra stuff um, mm. and, yeah. So they probably would have had quite a come down from that as well because the adrenaline would have been absolutely yeah. insane and yeah. that's a massive trauma to go through and then yeah, yeah. to relive that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I suppose for you, you're in and out of consciousness but sort of in like a dreamlike, surreal kind of a way. Yeah, and they're very much sober and freaking out. Yep. By yep. What's yeah, what's <laughs> happening? Yeah, I was. Uh, I, I don't think. I'm glad they're both back into into surfing as well and um, going really well. But yeah, um, if if I didn't survive that day, I think it would have been a, little, a different story for them. The other side of the coin is though that they saved your life too. Yeah, absolutely, and I'll never forget that. And yeah. Um, if it wasn't for them they did all the hard work you know they got me out of the water uh, if i there's no way even if i got bitten and lost my leg there's no way i was making it to that water's edge without them so and lucky there were so many people on the beach that day yep. too yeah um you know there's a lot of things there's that would have worked luck. in my favor <laughs> yeah. that day you know that shouldn't have um why they, why they even sent the helicopter why mm. there was three the three paramedics that never happens like yeah you were a religious man i'm not nah nah um but you know, it makes me think that, you know, something might something might have been watching. Yeah, mm. but yeah, crazy. And what was driving your recovery once you got past that um, really dark initial phase and you could start working towards prosthetics? How long did it take before you're like, I'm going to get back on the board? I think seeing other people go getting on getting on YouTube, getting on the internet, seeing other people doing really well, seeing other people surfing with one leg. I was like, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. And I don't know, not coming up with my own prosthetic because that's the thing that there's no nothing on the market that helps um, that could, could, for an above knee amputee um, to surf with because I think the thing with the above knee, you can't, you don't have that knee joint movement, so you can't lower your center of gravity when you. That's the biggest thing. Being able to, if you want to surf, you want to have, you need to be able to lower that center of gravity, and yeah. there's nothing on the market that can lock in that bent position. So. I mean, my prosthetist come up with this um, idea of like just my socket, a 20 degree angle adapter onto another, into like an aluminium pylon, into another adapter. And that created me standing in a bent position. Cool. And I gave it a few goes in the backyard, uh, just on the deck. And then for the first time, about a year and a half later, at um, just down in Middleton, down the south coast, and gave me on a really long board. And I fell off the first few times, but I eventually got the hang of it. And then... After that, I, yeah, 
Just, what did your mum think of you going back out there? Uh, yeah, I think and she would definitely not want me going back in Port Lincoln, but she was she she knew that I was going to do it and that if that was going to... And she knew it was a big part of my life, how much I love surfing. So, yeah, they, they were fine with it. They just probably still stress out a little bit. And what was it like getting on the board again after all that time? Yeah, it was unreal. Like, when I, when I first stood up, I was like, you know, I don't surf as good as I used to, but just having that feeling of being on a wave is all you need. I think and yeah it's um once i did it i was like yeah was that emotional yeah it was um it was more so for chloe who was watching on the beach she was yeah hysterical but um yeah it was it wasn't emotional but i was just more excited and stoked that i could do it yeah do you feel like this event altered the man that you were going to become or that it would have been you would have been the same oh i've definitely changed like i said i definitely changed um i've definitely become I think I'm more humble of more. I don't like I said. I don't take those things for granted that we all do every day. Um, it's definitely changed me in that way, and I think I'm I think I'm a better person for it. Yeah, and things I wouldn't have done. You know, I just I had no idea. I was sort of yeah. I, I was one of those people. Yeah, this will never happen to me. You know, and but it did, and. I've learned a lot from it. What so. do you find out about yourself in terms of your own perseverance and personal strength? That, uh, you know, I'm actually a lot stronger than I thought I was, that I can put up with a lot more stuff than I thought I could, that if you have the right mindset that you can um, do anything you want, yeah, and you can achieve anything you want to. How do you view surfing differently now? Not too much differently. I just try and... Um, try and assess the situation a little bit more before I go out, but I still get up and surf, still go about it the same way. It just takes me a little bit longer. I do a little bit differently. But don't really look at any any different apart from thinking about sharks a little bit more. But <laughs> yeah, a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I try not to put myself in that situation where I'm surfing a really sharky spot or yeah. if, it's really, if it's a similar weather to the day I was attacked, then I'll generally not surf. And getting back out there, did that bring back that memory any stronger because i imagine there'd be you'd have to really get over that bridge of not letting your mind obsess about that thought because then it would ruin it for you yeah i mean yeah i'd just try and yeah i I don't and i'd go go i never surf by myself so i'd go out and surf with other people and you know have a conversation out there and yeah try not to sit there and think about it keep moving around all that sort of stuff so yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) and one of your quotes is um Surfing now is hard, but not surfing would be harder. Yeah. So why do you say that? I think, you know, I knew I know how much I love surfing and how much that has been a big part of my mental recovery, getting back into that. And that's that's why I sort of say that. I think, you know, I knew if I wasn't, I didn't make that effort to get back into surfing. There was that, that one, that big part of my life that was not there and I had to get that back. And once I got that back, I knew I could... You know, I'd pretty much have my life back to normal, but yeah, it's definitely been a big part of my mental recovery, being able just just getting on with it and getting back back into surfing. And you can work as a carpenter still. Yeah, yeah, I still get on the roof, still do all that sort of stuff. Um, still work a physical job, which I, I know I won't be able to do forever. Um, but I, yeah, still still love doing it. So. Have you been surprised at how not limited you are, considering what happened, that you can still do everything? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I'm very lucky that I have a really good prosthetic. If I didn't have that prosthetic, I wouldn't be able to do half the stuff I could. But, and, you know, but you just adapt and just do everything. You know, you still do everything you're used to before. It might just be slower and different the way I did it before. But you just got to relearn all that stuff. And like I said, if you just go the right way about it, yeah. What about your sleeping, especially, um, I guess, from when it first happened to now? Um uh, do you still think about the shark? Do you do you dream about it? I uh, I don't have bad dreams. I do have the occasional dream where I am at the right point, and it's just I'm sort of just looking out, and it's just really calm. But there's there's no shark. There's no nothing there. There's not like really bad flashbacks. But I just occasionally get really weird really dreams like that. Um, but no no bad dreams or anything like that. Um, I'm being very lucky there. And you just try not to let your mind go there now, or you're at a point where you're at peace with it enough, and enough yeah. times passed. Sort of. I know, yeah, I know. When I get really stressed with work and I don't get enough sleep, that you know, I get 
Well, I, at one point, when I got really stressed at work, I was getting really bad anxiety and the anxiety attacks, like uncontrollable anxiety attacks where I was dizzy and I thought I was, you know, once in my body would go numb and like I was, you know, completely hysterical. And I started to learn the warning signs for that um, and what triggered them. And I try not to get myself, I try not to try and look after myself and not get lots of sleep and not get myself too stressed out. Um, I think that's very important. You know, a lot of people can have really stressful jobs. Yeah. And that can affect your mental health massively in a bad way. And I try to stop, you know, slow myself down and go go do more surfing, do the stuff that I enjoy do rather than think about that, that give me work ridiculous hours and, and stress myself out. Um, yeah, that's, I try and, I've sort of, because le- I've learned those warning signs that I, I try and um, try and stop doing that. And that's all a lot better. These yeah, days. yeah, a lot better. Yeah, yeah, mm. I can control it much better. So, what's your perspe- uh, What's your per- perceptive perspective? What's your perspective on everything that you've been through now? Um, oh, not really. I don't really look too deep on it that much. I mean, it's I can't change it. Um, you know, I, I I went back and surfed that day with. An injury, I probably shouldn't have surfed. I know that I can't change what happened, um, and I never will be able to. I was always going surfing that day, so, um, and I don't, you know, I'm only going to say I think it's the best thing that's happened to me. I don't think I'd rather not get attacked by a shark, but I just try and look at, the, take the positives out of what's happened and how, um, how I've become a better person in certain ways, and how I've been out to surprise myself how I've been able to get back into surfing, how I've. Um, yeah, I've surprised myself how I could do all that stuff and try and, and take on those things. I don't try and gloat on the past and what could have been and, yeah, I just try and get on with it. Mm. And you ended up writing a book about it all because so much had happened and you had to put it down. Yeah, so the doctor and myself, she came to me um, about... She was she was the first doctor on call in Port Lincoln and she made many vital decisions that helped save my life that day, um, stuff that she probably shouldn't have done, but now you're looking at it, she's glad she did. Um, so yeah, and we she said this needs to be in a book. So she, we did a lot of interviews and we, um, all the people that were involved at the day. I didn't want the book just to be about me. We wanted it to be about, um, everyone there that day and how, how that, how they've, it affected them and how they've grown from what's happened. Not just me, but yeah. how they've had post-trauma growth also and how they've become better people and, and also, there's a bit about the the fishing industry in Port Lincoln and and sharks and there's a bit bit for every, everyone in there but a lot of it's about my the tack and my my recovery and getting back on with it and yeah it's called caught inside it's um it's a, that's a surfing term um but it's generally a spot in the lineup when you don't when, where you don't want to get caught um and that's where I was and but there's always a way out of it so um for anyone going through a hard time or Anything like that, there, there's, my, yeah. If anyone can turn, there's always a way. No matter where you are, there's always a way out of it, um, and that's sort of what, what it's, what I think it's about. And yeah. what has creating the book done for you in your recovery process? It's been really good because there's been a lot of stuff in there that I, from hearing other people's perspective, that I didn't know, and it's been almost a bit of a healing process for everyone. Um, Michelle, that did a lot of the writing to myself and. And it's just good to get it all out there and, and if it can help anyone else in any way, that yeah, we're stoked. And where can people find that? They can find it on um, chrisblows.com.au and on a shop there, it's $25 or some bookstores, uh, Dylan's Bookshop Nord has it and a few other places around town. But that can all be found on our website. Um, yeah. Chris cool. That bookshop's on the way home, so I'm going to... Yeah, go yeah. past <laughs> and grab it. Yeah. That's awesome. Cool. Great, man. Well, no, thank, we've... thanks so much for sharing that. No that problem. story um it's it is a a rare one because there's yep. obviously not too many people go through that and and live to tell the tale but yep. um i think the way that you have responded to something that you couldn't control but you could control your your reaction and everything that's sort of happened since then you've certainly uh risen to the occasion as much as you can and yeah 
you know, you still seem like a very chilled out bloke who who was going to be who you were regardless. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Uh, with a bit of a, an edge of um, seriousness, which comes from, I suppose, just gratitude for the life that you're still able to live and, and understanding that life is precious and that... It can bang. change it. Yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, it's, it is a really in, um, inspiring story and I think powerful to people, especially who've been in a similar situation, but just... Um, yeah, anyone who's who's been through trauma or anyone who even hasn't to, to see someone with your kind of uh, attitude and, and take on things and the fact that you're not letting it stop you continue to do what you love because i think that's what really keeps us alive as well is that being is, able yeah. to keep doing those things yeah so thank you man all right thanks for having me if you're a fan of the work we're doing or have a suggestion for the show, please rate us on Apple Podcasts and leave a comment. You can follow Youngblood Men's Health Matters on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube and visit our website youngbloodmedia.com.au to stay up to date. And most importantly, if this conversation resonated with you, share it with someone you love and start a conversation of your own. A huge thank you to our local business supporters who've joined our mission to change the lives of young men for the better and help make this possible. We're all in it together. This is Youngblood. Thanks for being part of the mission. Catch you next time.